Buenas tardes desde la Escuela Española de Historia y Arqueología del CSIC en Roma. Bienvenidos otra vez eh, a esta tercera conferencia de nuestro seminario Online Talks, eh, un seminario que realizamos junto a Miriam Cubas de la Universidad de Alcalá y Harry Robson de la Universidad de York y evidentemente con la colaboración en la parte técnica de los compañeros de la Escuela del CSIC de Roma y en especial de Mateo Benati, que nunca se le ve, pero que está ahí detrás. Hoy me hace muy feliz tener como invitados a dos increíbles investigadores, como son François Brigua y Jean-Denis Vigny. Personalmente, para mí es un día especial, porque si Jean-Denis, al, al que no conocía personalmente, es un referente para todos nosotros, los que nos dedicamos al neolítico en el Mediterráneo, a François lo conocí cuando estaba haciendo mi tesis doctoral. En aquel entonces no solo fue extremadamente amable conmigo, sino que me enseñó muchas de las cosas que hoy conozco del utillaje lítico del neolítico del Mediterráneo Occidental. Aunque pensamos que son absolutamente conocidos, quiero presentarlos ahora en inglés. François Brigua is lecturer in archaeology at the L'École des... Uy, se compliqué por moi, eh, François. L'École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales and researcher at the UMFR Trace in Toulouse, en France. He is a specialist in stone tools and lithic technology. His current research focuses on the neolithic processes of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Holocene period in Northwest Africa. Today, with Jan Denis Vigne, he will tell us about his research in Cyprus, but remember he also directs other projects in Egypt. Well, Jan Denis Vigne is Emeritus Director of Research at the CNRS. He is working at the Muse National Museum of Natural History since the uh, 1970s, yes, Jan Denis. He has devoted his research at teaching uh, to the interactions between humans and other animals since the end of prehistory. Through his excavation and archaeological, uh, archaeological research, mainly in the Mediterranean, but also in Central Asia and China. He has written and edited 18 books. I don't know, 19 now, because he present now. <laughs> so the, 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 the one side, one formal side in, Ch in Cyprus, and more than uh, 4,050 uh, 4, scientific articles, uh, papers. Uh, merci à tous les deux d'avoir accepté cette invitation, uh, François Jean Denis. Uh, Dit que la votre présentation sera enregistrée sur YouTube et pourra être consultée en permanence. Et alors, vous savez les, les paroles. Uh, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, uh, Juan. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who invited us. Uh, I will try to, to share my screen um, in order to, to put the, the presentation. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Generally. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we will try to, to present uh, our last result uh, on Cyprus. And first of all, uh, a short presentation of the island and the general context of uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, Cyprus was never bridged to the mainland. The maximum pleniglacial regression did not significantly reduce the distance to the continent. Whenever an islet actually existed on the way to Cyprus, the sea voyage should have been 42 plus 25 kilometers long at the very minimum during the, pli the, the pleniglacial. At the very beginning of the Holocene, it should have been already 70 to 80 kilometers long and complicated by the surface oceanic currents. At the end of the 80s, we just learned that Epipaleolithic people were frequenting episodically the island about 10,500. This is the earliest evidence of human uh, in Cyprus still today. The Cypriot Neolithic was considered at that time to have started late, about 7000 BC, and to have generated markedly insular cultures, the culture of Kirikitia and the fifth millennium culture of Sotira. 
the three millennia of the PPNE and PPNB, which are here on the right, uh, known on the continent, were unknown at that time in Cyprus. The island was considered as a very peripheral region, the neuritization of which was a late epiphenomenon in the emergence of the Neolithic of the Near East. However, during the 90s and 20s, the discovery of large villages related to the Cypriot form of the PPNB, which is called Cyprus, Cyprus, Cypro PPNB, especially at Chirocambos and Milufkia, have deeply changed this conception. This moved the beginning of the Cyprus Neolithic 15 centuries earlier back after 8,300 calibrated BC. Excavations conducted during the last 10 years at Tumbogunos, Timonas, and at Asprokremnos evidenced the presence of a Cypro PPNA and again pushed back the beginning of the Neolithic in Cyprus of at least seven centuries. In this presentation, we will present the new archaeological information collected during the last 15 years about the history of the colonization and the Neolithic transition of the island, mostly based on the four sites that are uh, highlighted here. That is to say, uh, Etokremnos, Asprokremnos, Shirokambos, and Klimonas, with a special focus, of course, on the later. We will successively examine four chronological phases, the Epipaleolithic, the Cypro PPNA, the early Cypro PPNB, and the middle and late Cypro PPNB. For the different step of this long evolution, we will try to evidence, sorry, we will try to, to uh, sorry, I'm lost now, <laughs> uh, to, to evidence the presence of a Cypro, um, no, sorry, uh, yes, um, Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, yes, for, for the different step of this uh, long evolution, we will try to evidence the particular contributions of this island area to the understanding of the Neolithic transition process in Southeast Asia. And finally, we will devote a few minutes to our most recent uh, discovery which for the first time likely lifts the veil on the totally unknown Cypriot people of the 10th millennium. So first, uh, the Epipaleolithic period. The small shelter of Etokremnos is the only undisputable Epipaleolithic site in Cyprus because it is indeed the only one which uh, associated fireplaces, flint tool and food refuses. Uh, the filling uh, here on the picture uh, taken by uh, Alan Simmons, thank you to him to have given me the, this picture. The filling described uh, two steps uh, uh, in the history of this shelter, well separated by a sterile layer. The lower layer figures here in, uh, in orange. Um, the, the, this lower layer uh, figures the endemic Cyprus fauna before the frequentation by humans with huge densities of pygmy hippos and elephants. The Bayesian processing of more than 30 dating allowed to date this natural bone accumulation between 11,000 and 10,500 calibrated BC. There is no more unremoved hippo or elephant bone in the upper layer suggesting that this endemic fauna got extinct about 10,500 BC. This upper layer here in, uh, in blue uh, has been accumulated by a human being who frequented the shelter around 10,500 uh, BC. The lithic tool set doesn't differ from the Anatolian epipaleolithic industries except the absence of obsidian. The food refuses were mainly composed of shellfish and fish and bird bones. However, 17 small sized bones of ungulates revealed that these people recently introduced wild boar to Cyprus and hunted them. They likely introduced them for stocking the island in large game after the extinction of hippos and elephants. 
This is the earliest known evidence of control of ungulates in Southwest Asia, 2000 years before the earliest evidence of pig, cattle, goat, and sheep management on the continent. This is the first original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the Neolithic process in Southwest Asia. Second step of the story, uh, the Cypro PPNA. The Cypro PPNA is now documented by two principal sites, Asprocremnos and Climonas. Together, they provided a very homogeneous set of, of, of about 60 radiocarbon dates. They are calibrated between 9,200 and 8,600 BC. This large interval is due to the multiple plateaus of calibration curve for this period. Stuart Manning proposed a Bayesian model which reduces this interval around the date 8,800 calibrated BC. This is the second original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the Neolithic process in Southwest Asia, at least at its late phases the PPNA extended also to Cyprus beyond the seas. This indicates that sea voyages were unsuspectedly developed. Just one picture of um, uh, Asprocremnos in homage to Carol McCartney, who passed over recently. What is Cyprus PPNA is very different from those of the, of the continent. As Procremnos provided nearly 10 round buildings, some of them being semi-embedded. Carol convincingly interpreted this site as a non-permanent settlement for the specialized exploitation of flint and ochres. Klimanas was located on a natural terraced gentle slope looking toward the sea which is only two kilometers far from, from the site. Our excavations between 2010 and 2016 concerned about 1,000 square meters. They allowed to estimate the preserved surface of the human occupation to half an hectare, which is within the, the red line. The middle terrace seems to have been the center of the site with a big building and to the south, the peripheral curvy linear trenches of a series of very eroded smaller buildings in, in blue, down to the picture over there. East and north, thick and well-preserved PPNA deposits that were only partly excavated. The big building was circular, semi-embedded, with a peripheral earth wall settled in a, foundation, in a foundation trench. It has been eroded in such a way that the south extremity here on the left of the picture was on the point to be destroyed. We found central and peripheral pole hole, which suggests the presence of a light roof and the preservation of the PPNA level of circulation besides the building allows estimating that the floor was one meter deep. This means that the PPNA people excavated uh, a total of 70 cube meters uh, for uh, doing this embedded building, which is a lot, of course. The profile excavated in the fillings of the building revealed that the latter were composed of the rests of a series of at least four successive buildings which were rebuilt the one on the other with, with earth uh, material in the same initial 10 meter pit. That is to say that at the end, the, the last phase of reconstruction of the building is not anymore embedded also. The earliest building here on the picture at the end of the excavation of 2012 opened to the Northeast by a three meter large lateral entrance, which is well visible over there. The, the, at the opposite of the entrance, the floor is slightly higher, forming a kind of amphitheater. To the north, there were 20 to 30 centimeter high earth benches. The principal pole, the, 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 
the, the, the peripheral poles, sorry, were paired and regularly outspaced. The earth walls were preserved in the north half of the peripheral trench. The floor was, was riddled with pole holes, offering pits, fireplace, and so on. We interpreted this uh, building as a communal building, similar to the ones excavated in PPNA sites, such as Jeff El Armar, Tel Arbor in the Frates Valley, or Wadi Feinan in Jordan. This is the third original contribution of Cyprus to the understanding of the Neolithic process in Southeast Asia. Not only PPNA people settled to Cyprus, but they imported there the complex model of the earliest villages of the communal building and likely of the social organization that produced them. South to the building, to the communal building uh, in, the, in the B sector here, we excavated in 2015 and 2016. Here we found a, a series of, of uh, smaller buildings. On about 40, uh, 400 square, square meters, we discovered the floor, fireplace, and peripheral foundation trenches of at least 25 buildings overlapping the ones on the others. All of them are terraced in the slope but they are not really embedded. They are only notched in, in, the, in the slope. For example, here we see three successive buildings settled in the same terrace. We can see the three uh, uh, peripheral trenches in, in which uh, the, 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 the earth wall was, was settled. And, um, and, uh, and we see also the three successive fireplaces. You have one here, second and third. Uh, the, 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 the earliest being that one. Uh, and uh, for the, the later building, the later of these three buildings, we can see also here the, the cup mark. The walls were built on earth, in earth with only some wooden poles for supporting the downslope parrots, which is most of the time destroyed uh, in the slope of the, of the site. The stone were not used for building, except for making steps for the entrance. For the building technique, the Cyclo PPNA appears as an additional regional variant. It fits the large range of the Southwest Asian PPNA diversity of models. Climonas produced more than, than three tons of flint, and I will leave the talk to, to Francois for uh, explaining more in detail about uh, this uh, huge collection of flint. Yes, thank you. Uh, all, of, all of them uh, came from the, the local uh, Lefkarl Chalks, which, which is uh, at least uh, than 15 minutes uh, walking to the site. The two natural kinds of flint are represented, translucent, 69%, and uh, opaque, uh, 31%. We found four obsidian blades or bloodlets. Bernard Gratus uh, analyzed three of them and found that they, they were coming from uh, Goludag 5, source 5. These are the oldest obsidian attestation indicating that Cyprus was connected to the networks of the Levant. Blood production appears to have been exclusively unidirectional and aimed to produce small triangular blades with a rectilinear uh, profile of four or five centimeters long. Big blades give an idea of the size of the initial core. A second type of production is a bidirectional mode of core exploitation, but it was very rare. However, no predetermined uh, or central blade is apparent. We find several hundreds of arrays which were extracted from unidirectional debitage. They present a short triangular tank and an opposite extremity sharpened by bifacial oblique cartouche. The blood technology and the arrowheads of Clemonas 
could be related with the Meribetian of the Middle Euphrat Valley, more precisely the phase three of Meribet, Sherhassan, and also in phase one of Jade. The lozenge types also find convergence with Upper Mesopotamia in an American context. Tools are dominated by burins of all kinds, then by hand scrapers. The points with tongue show fractures, impact marks, and more discrete traces re related to hunting activities. In the, on, on the next year, so thank you. There are also many glossy blades that are related to harvesting activities. It's uh, the work of uh, uh, Laurent Sastruc, Nicolo Matsuko, and uh, Bernard Gassin. The macrolytic industry are represented by over 830 tools. So far, 20 morphology types have been described with over 30 different functions. Hammer stones, groved hammer stones, cup mark, anvil, cairns, handstone, slad, slate of uh, limestone, which are in some case covered of ochre and shaft straightener. Seashells were not part of the diet of the Pepena vi villagers and were exclusively used for symbolic production and technical activities. The shells are mostly local and fossil. Hundreds of shells were perforated by percussion and show evidence of suspension. Perforated sweet teeth have, uh, has been ident identified. Local soft green stones belonging to the serpentinite family were also used for the manufacture of beads and pennants. Blanks and the finished products, stone beads, are highly diversified and uh, do, do not show any standardization. Despite these uh, massively used local Cypriot geological and mineral resources, except for obsidian, all the different aspects of the material culture, either tools or symbolic objects, appear to be regional variant or of their continental PPNA counterparts. Was the economy also within the range of our of the Southwest Asian continent, PPNA? Seeds are poorly preserved, but we found some impressions of cereals in building earth hardened by fire, together with some chaired seeds of pistachia, amygdalus, barley, and emmer wheat. The latter is not native in Cyprus and has been introduced from the continent. Sickles, green stones, numerous, numer sorry, sorry. Um, uh, um, okay. Sickles, green stones, several shafts, and phytoliths in the building earth are additional evidence of cultivation of wild cereals. The faunal remains refer to a very limited number of species. The small wild boar represented 95% of the identified specimens. This is the same endemic form, 30% smaller as on the continent, and we reduced locomotor capabilities. Age at death and sex ratio indicate that these wild boar were hunted. The domestic dog is also represented by some bones and by numerous knowing marks on the suet bones. Together with the endemic Cypriot mouse, we evidence the presence of the commensal mouse recently introduced to the con from the continent. Cat is very rare, but already present. The rest of the faunal remains refer to birds and freshwater crabs and uh, uh, terrestrial tortoise. There is not any remain of any marine animal, including shellfish. The economic model perfectly fits the one of the continental PPNA. It's based on cereal cultivation and storage 
and on wild boar hunting. The differences consist in the poor variety of resources and result from the insular context. Now, move, uh, we will move to the, to the early Cypro PPND, um, so uh, about 8,000 uh, to, to 8,500 and 8,000 uh, calibrated BC. The early uh, Cypro PPNV is represented by the well 116 at Milutkia and by the phase early A of the large settlement of Shiro Combos. The letter provided 12 radiocarbon dates uh, ranging uh, within this, uh, the time, this time uh, interval between 8,500 and 8,200 BC. At Chiro the early phase A deposits are composed of very eroded features and of middle layers. The building are only represented by fragments of plaster. The most remarkable features are seven uh, meter deep water wells, which are the earliest known in the world. Similar wells have been found also at Milutkia. One of these wells provided the famous green stone sculpture representing an anthropomorphic feline head. Whole holes suggest the presence of small round buildings out of earth and protected by decorated coating. A series of narrow ditches interrupted by uh, 80 centimeters wide doors suggest the presence of large enclosures. They can be interpreted either as protections for the cultivation against animals or as enclosures for animals. Anyways, they suggest the beginning of breeding presence of animals in the village or very near it. The faunal remains confirm this. In addition to the species already attested at Climonas, that is to say dogs, cat and mice and the overwhelming dominant wild boar, we found a small number of domestic goat and cattle. They were necessarily introduced from the continent very short after the first domestication. And they are actually domestic, early domestic animals. This is a very strong evidence that husbandry actually started at the early PPNB on the continent. It's interesting to notice that the early domestic goat uh, in, in this period was uh, immediately released to the wild and hunted as a second game besides the wild boar. Uh, and I will give the talk to, to Francois for the flint industry <laughs> again. Uh, Francois, your ton micro est, est fermé. Uh, I am sorry. Uh, the flint. Uh, the, the, the flint came from the, the same local uh, Lefkara Chalk uh, as for Climonas. The, the translucent chert was uh, preferentially selected in the, in, the, in the first period. 95 obsidian bladelets were coming for, from the, the Goludag, mostly from the Komurchu Kaletepe source. All the obsidian bladelets were knapped by pressure according to Kaletepe's technological model, but not in Cyprus. Huh? The, the blank have been imported ready for use in Cyprus. The main chain operatoire focused on the production of long and rectilinear, rectilinear blades, starting from a naviform core by bidirectional technology. These blades, were mostly used for making big arrays, the proximal extremity of which was shaped by inverse and parallel pressure retouch and by two notches. Other blades were used unretouched for producing longitudinal sacral blades. Here again, Cyprus present a regional variant of the bidirectional knapping, which is so emblematic of the Levantine PPNB. The early B, early C, uh, middle and late phases of Shiro combos describe the evolution of the Cypro PPNB along the eighth millennium in parallel to the middle and late PPNB on the continent. 
the Bayesian processing made by Thomas Perrin of the 39 million carbon dates allow to precise the duration of each phase here uh, in, this, uh, in this picture. The first half of the eight millennium, that is the middle side probe PPNB, is represented by small round buildings very similar to the ones of the early A phase. Six to seven meters deep wells were still excavated and used at that period. We also found a large collective burial with more than 60, 16 individuals and 11 individuals burials, more or less similar to the ones which have been found at Kirukitia for the next millennium. In one of the individual burial, the human was associated with the, the earliest domestic cat known uh, in, the, in Cyprus and in the world. This discovery, together with the introduction of cats to Cyprus uh, with uh, the, the pre-domestic agriculture and commensal mouse, evidence that cats have been domesticated somewhere in the Levant 5,000 years before Egypt. From the beginning to the end of the 8th millennium, we observe a drastic reversal of the proportion of the translucent flints versus the opaque flints. This proportion of the, the, the proportion of uh, obsidian also decreased to a very low rate. It still came from the Guludag, but its origin partly shifts from Kaletepe to Bittercular in Ginlik. During the, the first half, half of the eighth millennium, we also observed the continuation of the bidirectional knapping technology and the production of rectilinear, rectilinear blades for making, among others, big arrays uh, for this industry. However, the blades tend to become le less regular and less carefully made. The longitudinal cycle blades are replaced by crescent shaped bucket blades exhibiting gloss, oblique gloss. During the second half of the eighth millennium, corresponding with, with the late Cypro PPNB and the seventh millennium Kirokitian culture, the bidirectional knapping decreased and the big blade technology progressively vanished. During the PPNB, local fossil shells, many specimens show evidence of, the, of the, their use. Large fossil spondylus are also, also used as a small cup for stealing soft material. Local soft green stones are also used for the manufacture of beads and pennants. Blanks are finished, products are present at the, at the site. The beads are not standardized and show a higher diversity than du during the, the PPNA with, with the, the introduction of large rings and pennants decorated of lattice pattern. A single exogenous uh, red carnelian bead is identified at the end of the PPNB. You see the, the spency, this uh, nice specimen uh, on, up on the right. Despite the use of local raw material for the bead manufacture, Cypriot villagers preserved aesthetic standards commonly adopted on the continent. This is the case of the green stones, which are very common on the continent all along the PPN. The decrease of the tusk shells at the end of the PPN, which is also observed in the South Levant, and the adoption of the red color at the end of the PPNB observed at the same period in the Euphrat region. This table recapitulates the complex sequence of interactions between humans and animals during the Cypro-PPNB. 
Red, orange, and green refer respectively to wild, commensal, or domestic animal populations. During the middle cyclo PPND, three new species were introduced the Mesopotamian fallow deer, sheep, domestic sheep, and the fox. They were respectively released in the wild for the first one and hunted herded with two successive different lineages for, the, for sheep and tolerated probably in the villages as commensal for fox. Domestic dogs and cattle disappeared from the site and were absent from Cyprus for the five following millennia in the Kirikitia and Sotira cultures as well. Mice are still abundant commensals and cat progressively moved to a statute of commensal to to, to pet keeping or domestication. The Cypriot wild boar, finally, and the feral goat were locally domesticated during the middle and the late PPND, respectively. They gave birth to the local domestic lineages, which were bred during the rest of the Neolithic in Cyprus. This is very important to, to notice that on Cyprus, animals uh, were domesticated like uh, on, the, on the continent. The evolution of the proportion of hunting versus animal breeding is far from being linear. It's characterized by a rapid succession of different systems of animal food supply. Wild boar hunting with a small development of cattle and maybe pig and goat breeding during the early phase A. Strong development of farming during the early phase B with cattle, sheep, and pig breeding, but in parallel, strong development of deer hunting. Abrupt decrease of the husbandry at the transition between early and middle phases, transition between the middle PPNB and late PPNB. Strong development of pig breeding during the middle phases A, but deer hunting remains important. And finally, strong development of sheep and goat uh, herding with a return to the wild boar hunting. The large variability of the situations and the nonlinear trajectory can also be, be, be suspected, could also be suspected on the continent, looking at the large series of sites, like in this small diagram. Uh, but because of its insularity, Cyprus provides a more refined scenario of the complexity of the beginning of animal husbandry during the eighth millennium at the local scale. Last but not least, the, uh, our new project, uh, which, is, which tried to address the question, uh, what about the 10th millennium? We learned a lot during the last 30 years about the unsuspected early Neolithic story of Cyprus during the eighth and ninth millennia. But we still know nothing about the 10th millennium between the Epipaleolithic occupation of Akrotiri and the village of Crimonas. Was, was there a long PPN story on Cyprus, or did the island stay apart from the first steps of the PPN? Our new project consists in looking after the 10th millennium occupations. The geomorphological investigation that have been developed by Pantelidza Milona here on the picture. Um, during her PhD uh, in, in Paris, in the framework of the Climonas project, made it clear that this is a very difficult task. Indeed, Pantelidza demonstrated that a very strong erosive phase started with the early warming of the Holocene, which abruptly and strongly deepened the valleys. This provoked a strong erosion of all the slopes and probably the destruction of all the putative archaeological sites anterior to 9200 BC, which were on these slopes. After this date, the sites such as Crimonas or Shirokombos are admittedly very eroded, but they, they are still visible. This is why, in spite of our numerous prospections, surveys, and so on, we never found anything potentially referring to the earlier periods in the slopes and in the bottom of the valleys. 
However, some small limestone plateaus escape this massive erosion. This is the case of the Armenokori Plateau, uh, which appears clearly discordant to all the other geological layers uh, in, uh, in, in the, on, on this map. This is the, the white uh, part here, which is horizontal when all the other layers are, um, are obliques. In addition, this plateau is located very near Climonas and Chirocambos, as, as you can see on the picture. This is why, starting 2019, we concentrated our surveys on this small plateau. The geomorphological study of the Armenokori Plateau revealed small, oblong, grassy plains composed, you can see here, here is Francois, but here is the, is the grassy plain, and these grassy, grassy uh, small plains are uh, settled on red clay uh, soils coming from the alteration and decomposition of the surrounding castified limestones that you can see here, and you can see maybe here again. Uh, these plains appear to have resulted from the rapid filling of pre-Holocene valleys. This was a good confirmation that this place ex escaped the early Holocene erosion and could have preserved some pre-Holocene sites. We reconstructed the profile of three of the small fossil valleys here in red on the, on the map. And uh, in parallel, we developed uh, pedestrian surveys and found a lot of uh, flint uh, items that Francois will comment now. Yes, uh, in our pedestrian surveys, we collected uh, numerous flint, marking a clear difference from the industrial background well characterized for the NINS and the eighth millennia. Uh, this, uh, this collection of flint is constituted by a microlithic industry made on, blood, on bloodlets and small tools, including scrappers, burins, and denticulates. Projectile points are missing, but it will be necessary to wait for the excavation to determine if there, is, there are any and of what kind there were. Geophysical surveys of the most uh, promising uh, locality, combining uh, electrical and uh, magnetic measurements, provide encouraging res results. A higher magnetic uh, susceptibility area shows a set of annular magnetic anomalies of one meter to three meters in size. An anthropogenic origin of these characteristics may therefore be suspected. The purpose of our presentation was to highlight how the discoveries of these last 30 years in Cyprus contributed to increase the knowledge and understanding of the development of the early Neolithic in Southwest Asia. It's time now as a conclusion, to try to recapitulate the main lessons from Cyprus. First of all, Cyprus made us more careful with reference to the absence of evidence in archaeology. 30 years ago, the Cypriot Neolithic began with the markedly original regional culture of Kirukitia, about 6,800 BC. We added two millennia of an unsuspectedly rich Cypriot treasury before that date, and propose now a completely opposite interpretation, pointing out the overwhelming similarities with the continent at the beginning of the story. And we are hopefully on the, on the point to add something about the 10th millennium during the next month of, of years, inshallah. Second, it appeared that the PPN cultures developed overseas as well. This means that the sea could have played an, an unsuspected role in the emergence of the Neolithic in Southwest Asia. This also suggests that the settlement of Ireland, which is considered as part of the Neolithic package during its spread to 
through the Mediterranean between seven thousand seven the, the seventh millennium and the sixth millennium was already an important manifestation of the Neolithic expansion as soon as the very beginning. This should incited us to look at the underwater sites uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, where possibly there, there were a very important story uh, at the very beginning of the Neolithic. Third point, many cultural traits in the technologies of building, of making stone tools and beads and pendants convincingly please for the idea that Cyprus was not more divergent from the continental PPN model than any other Southwest Asian region. The organization and location of the villages, the emergence of cultivation, then of animal husbandry also argue in favor of this vision. Cyprus increased the panel of the different region where the PPN developed in Southwest Asia. It contributes to refine the list of the traits common to all the PPN regions or specific to the regional variations. Four, it's also interesting to observe that the local insular conditions, yet very uh, unusual in this panel, did not significantly modify the expression of and trajectory of the PPN development in Cyprus. These particular conditions finally only impacted the nature of the lithic raw material for tools and jewels and the diversity of the cultivated plants and reared animals, which are drastically constrained by the incredibly low local biodiversity. People even artificially increased this biodiversity by introducing new plant and animal taxa. Five, in turn, this introduction illustrates for the first time so clearly the exchanges at the regional scale. This question of exchanges between the, the, the different regions rested a kind of black box for us on the continent where the natural resources are more or less similar between the different PPN regions. The very specific natural geo and biodiversity of Cyprus allowed to identify the obsidian, of course, as a product of introduction, but also some domestic and moreover wild animals. Their transportation from one place to another was only suspected on the continent, never so clearly evidenced as a major component of the emergence of the Neolithic food supply system. Migration of people is also supported by Cyprus better than any other region in Southwest Asia, even though it's not a very clear question at that time. Six, insularity also brings the opportunity to disentangle the local innovations from the external inputs. It's, for example, interesting to observe that the middle PPNB people domesticated the local wild boar or feral goat rather than importing domestic lineages from the mainland, although they were also importing, in the same time, domestic lineages of cattle and sheep. It's also interesting to observe that so called peripheral PPN region could have produced very original technical innovations, such as these deep water wells that are mostly known today in Cyprus. This strengthens the idea that the PPN cultures were resulting from both diverse regional innovations and their transfer to other regions where they were integrated to the PPN package. Seven. The very poor local biodiversity of Cyprus allowed to identify transportation of animals that would not be evidence on the continent, except with DNA sequence, sequences that, besides, are unfortunately missing. For example, the very early management of wild boar and cat, the anthropogenic transfer of mice, foxes, and fallow deer could only be evidenced because they were initially absent. These species were initially absent from Cyprus. No doubt that similar transportation were processed on the continent, where they are, however, undetectable. Last but not least, all these transportations, especially the ones of big animals such as cattle, really re reveal unsuspected skills for such an early period for both, both boat construction and navigation techniques. But this is another story and we could uh, develop uh, uh, an, uh, an ex another 40-minute uh, presentation about this question and we have no time to do that, unfortunately. I will finish on this picture 
for uh, acknowledge all the, the, the institutions which contribute to our different missions, but also to, allow, to, to acknowledge our colleagues, some, most of the time young colleagues, who contributed to, to this presentation and who are here on the field excavating also. Uh, I, I name uh, Jérôme Robitaille, uh, here a specialist of macro tool, Solange Rigaud, specialist of uh, pendants and beads and all these uh, beautiful things, and, uh, and uh, Pantelitza Milona uh, uh, and, and many others. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that we will have we will leave time enough for for discussion and, and questions. Uh, thank you, Francois, Denis, and Denise, for this presentation. is incredible. <laughs> Uh, I think Harry, uh, for the question, Harry, yeah. Indeed, yeah. Uh, many thanks again for that and apologies for not introducing myself at the beginning. You were deep in discussion and I uh, I didn't want to, to butt in, but yeah, uh, both uh, really appreciated and uh, a really good, fascinating talk. I've got quite a few questions and I, I might have missed a few things because I've got a massive headache but uh that said uh, i've got a few questions myself and then we've also got a few questions in the chat as well uh, which is good uh, so so just to start off then uh you suggested the that you had uh domesticated swine in the uh epi paleolithic uh uh assemblages was that based entirely on morphometrics or was DNA analysis undertaken? Uh, yes, uh, unfortunately we have, we, have no, uh, we have no DNA. We tried uh, many times to extract DNA as you can imagine. And uh, unfortunately uh, we failed all the time because these bones are, the, the organic matter in the bone is very, very damaged. Um, what we can say uh, about the, the, this history of, of the swines is first that they have been introduced to Cyprus about 10,500 BC, but they were introduced as wild animals and they were released in the wild uh, and, and, and they, they, they stocked the island very fast probably and they, they have been used uh, as, as uh, it's evidenced by Climanus, they, they, they have been used as the, the principal or the only game on the island by the PPNA uh, hunters, uh, and uh, and uh, the question that subsisted uh, until the, this last month finally was uh, wh where this this introduced but local uh, swines of Cyprus um, uh, dom locally domesticated, or did some uh, domestic early domestic uh, uh, Swedes were introduced from the continent. And uh, it, it was very difficult to, to, to decide this with uh, classical uh, morphometric uh, techniques. Of course, DNA would have been much better, for sure. And uh, in addition, the series were not large enough to, to, to decide. The, the work that we did uh, and which is not yet published because we are writing the papers for the monograph of uh, of Klimas. The work that we did uh, was of of two kind. First one, we we collected huge series of measurements uh, on the, on the, the Klimas uh, bones. We have uh, twenty one thousand bones in Klimas. Uh, not all of them being uh, measurable, of course. <laughs> Far from that, uh, but it's it's a huge collection, uh, and uh, and uh, and it allows us to to process the the classical metric measurements, not only with the the, the traditional uh, statistical tools, but to but to develop log shape ratios approaches, which are more uh, they, they cannot they cannot decide by alone, but they are much more informative. And second, we developed uh, two, two big projects of uh, geometric morphometrics with Thomas Kuki and his group. Um, 
based on the on the shape of the tooth and of the shape of the calcaneus. And uh, this uh, this uh, studies clearly confirmed that we have already suspected with the classical measurements that the the eight millennium um, domestic uh, uh, pigs of Shirokombos are uh, significantly different from the domestic one of the continent. And they are similar, exactly similar to this uh, Cypriot uh, wild boar uh, which have been introduced two, two, two millennia uh, earlier. So now it's clear for us that these swines have been domesticated locally uh, and, and much probably uh, we have less information, but some of them are clear and less and, and much probably uh, the pigs of Kirkitia, for example, are really the offsprings of this local uh, suids. What is really strange is that we have no mark of introgression of domestic pig in these lineages. Maybe we, if we had DNA, maybe we would have been able to detect some small inputs uh, of introgressions coming from the continent. But at that time, with the morphometry geometric techniques, it's something that it's clear. It's fascinating. It really is this... Uh... This localized domestication taking place on the island. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> and, and we have the same with, with goat that we had, we had demonstrated earlier, uh, four or five uh, years ago. We have the same, um, we see the process of domestication with goat. That, that is to say that we see first the, the demographic change, which is due to management. And then we see uh, two or three centuries later, we see the morphological decrease of size and decrease of the of the sexual dimorphism, and and finally the first true morphologically domestic goat are, are found at Kirukitia in the seventh millennium. So it takes it's a, a fantastic laboratory for for looking at domestication because there is no wild uh, input or, or very little, and and we see this the the duration of this process from the the management. To the, mod, to, to the morphological modification, which is several centuries. So the final question then I have regarding this, uh, I'll definitely do some reading because it, it really is, it's, it's mind blowing stuff. Uh, do, you think, do you think they would have transported, uh, say younger, small juvenile uh, swine on say rafts or, or boats or some watercraft technology from the mainland to Cyprus and then released these young juvenile ones because I, I assume it would be very difficult to say trap a, a like a fully grown wild boar in in the Levant and then to transport that to an island they're going to be very aggressive I assume and uh, and quite difficult to um to get your hands on them no no uh, if yeah generally speaking you're right and I agree with you but if there is one species which is easy to manage, uh, even with young individuals, it's pig. Mm. But it, it, it's completely unsurprising that the first animal which is introduced, even with rather simple techniques of navigation, is pig. Because uh, piglets are um, weaned very early. Uh, piglets uh, are, uh, are numerous in the same uh, laydown, uh, so you can take a, a series of five, six uh, animals. Uh, they are small and they, and they are uh, relatively familiar when they are young. So it's easy to transport eight young animals which are weaned and, and you can release them. And as their demography is really adapted to, to uh, a strategy of colony of colonization of new territories, it will uh, um, disseminate everywhere on the island without predator, except humans, uh, and without competitor, no, no herbivore, no other. Uh, so this is the, not a, 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 a big challenge to introduce um, piglets to, to, to Cyprus. However, this is a completely different story with ruminants. Because ruminants, especially the big ones such as uh, 
cattle uh, need to move uh, in order to evacuate the gas. It's a, a bit trivial, but, <laughs> but that's true. If you, in, if you keep uh, sitting a cow on a boat uh, during uh, more than five hours, it will not be able to, to, it will be paralyzed because of the accumulation of pressure of gas in, in, the, in the body, which press on the, on the nerves and, and, and make that the, the, the cow cannot uh, walk again. So this is something that we, we cannot understand very well at that time, but at least this suggests that they, they, have, they had to, to at, the, at that time of introduction of cattle, they had to, to, to go very fast from the continent to the island with big uh, boats, mm. big enough uh, for uh, a big cattle, even if you transport it, uh, uh, early wind uh, uh, a calf, uh, it's uh, 200 kilos, so it's big. <laughs> uh, and, and, and if you want them to move on the boat, the boat should be big and the animal should be really uh, uh, gentle <laughs> and calm. <laughs> or they can swim uh, <laughs> together with the boat. We can imagine a lot of, of, of devices, but, uh, but it's not clear at that time how they did that. What is true is that navigation was uh, a well mastered techniques for uh, making this intro introduction successfully enough to settle a permanent population on the island of cattle. This is clear. Mm -hmm. And another point is also coming from, from the mice, because if you want to introduce mice, uh, you can do it very easy, easily with a small boat, but most of the time you don't want to do that. You have no reason to do that objectively. And, and the, the mice should have been uh, stowed away uh, on the boats, uh, so accidentally introduced. So the boat should have been big enough for the mouse to hide. And, and the second point, which is really important and coming also from geometric morphometric works of Tomakuti, is that we, we see no, absolutely no morphological divergence between the mice of the, of the early ninth millennium uh, and, and the mice of the continent. And we, we saw no divergence between the mice of the eighth millennium in Cyprus and the mice on the continent. And the same for the seventh millennium. So that is to say that there is a constant flow of genes coming from the continent. And we can even estimate this flow of genes uh, of uh, effective uh, in, introduction of uh, reproductive individuals into the Cyprus population at least twice a year. This means that the intensity of the traffic is very important twice a year. That is to say that at least 10, 20 times a year, a boat was coming from the continent mm. and by chance, it transported an effective individual able to, to, to cross uh, with the local populations of Cyprus uh, uh, one time, one, 10 percent of the, of the time. So uh, this is also an interesting uh, information, even though we are not able to draw the boats of the PPNA, we are not able to know what people knew about navigation. We are just able. We are just able at that time to say that they were mastering this navigation much better than we suspected before. Even though we can also suspect that they failed a series of times, uh, because this is the story of navigation, even today <laughs> or in the historical times. Yeah, tremendous. There's a couple of follow-on questions, really, with that. Uh, the, the final one on the wild boar. Uh, <laughs> Comes from uh, comes from the chat, and it's by uh, Mike F. Statiu. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation. And his question is: How many wild boar would have been brought to the island to create a genetically diverse local population? Many of them. <laughs> Simple. It depends. There is no uh, unique answer to this question. It depends on the genetic diversity. Uh, that they represent. If they are all um, brothers and sisters, they will represent a, a low diversity, genetic diversity, and uh, the risk of uh, unadaptability or uh, rapid extinction is higher. But by chance, a low diver diversity can also fit 
the local conditions because they are not very much constrained. So it's really difficult to, to tell. But what is sure is that from a bi pure biological point of view, it's really unlikely that only one introduction uh, would be able to, to, to stock all the islands for a long time. Much probably there were several introductions mm -hmm. coming from different places. But this is also another question from where did they come? So we have information, Francois showed a lot, a lot of information with the lithic industry, with obsidians. That this is a, 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 an important path for understanding the, the connections. And, uh, and we look to, to the south, southeast uh, Anatolia or North Levant, of course. But uh, for Swedes, it's difficult because the comparisons with the continent, are, are the, the coverage of uh, data for the continent is, is uneven and it's difficult to have a, a clear comparison. But again, for mice, it's very clear, and this is published last, uh, last year, it's very clear that the, the, the earliest mouse, domestic mouse in, in Cyprus, is coming from Southeast Anatolia, not for the North Levant, not for the South Levant. And what is interesting is that when you look at the mice of the uh, middle PPNB, Cyprus middle PPNB, the main connections are with the North Levant. And when you look to the uh, PPNC or late PPNB period in Cyprus, the connections are more with the South Levant. So there is a kind of shifting of the in input of mice, at least, uh, not, not a shifting from the north to the south, but a, a widening of the area of, uh, of input uh, from a, a northern area at the beginning to a, a, a larger area, large to, to, to the south, much probably. But this is the mouse markers, and we can see uh, other markers such as the cornaline that uh, Francois presented just before, so the, we have to combine all this kind of information for understanding what happened. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the main important, the most important thing that uh, in this in this uh, purpose is that uh, finally Cyprus is part of this big uh, PPN uh, area, uh, and uh, and with influence is coming from everywhere, maybe at any any time of the PPN story, with different. Uh, ponderations uh, through time, of course. So that follows on. Thanks very much. That follows on uh, to to a next question, and uh, it was earlier on. And somebody asked, "Can you further describe the evidence for contact during the PPN uh, between Cyprus and the Levant?" I mean, you've you've obviously discussed the uh, the presence of the wells, and then you've suggested that obviously got the, the pigs and the goats come in beforehand and then followed by the, the imports of the, the cattle and the sheep, uh, as well as the lithic tools. Is there any further evidence uh, of contact? You mean you mean uh, contact from Cyprus to, to the continent? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or, or the other the other kind of follow-on question then is uh, obviously we have all these these surrounding regions whereby they are converging almost on Cyprus itself. Is there any, uh, let's say, transport or movement of either raw materials, resources, artifacts going the other way from, say, Cyprus itself to, to the uh, Levant or nearby coastlines? Um, I think that Francois will, will bring more information probably, but I, I think that we have not any one um, indication of uh, transportation of raw material or even techniques from Cyprus to the continent before the, the Copper Age, where, of course, Cyprus uh, furnished a lot of different areas in Eastern Mediterranean with, with, with Copper. I mm -hmm. think that there is no, uh, and, and this and it's difficult to know if the green stones, for example, coming from Cyprus, which are produced in, uh, in, in huge quantities uh, in Cyprus, uh, this picrolite, uh, was uh, ever transported to the continent. I don't know, maybe we need a lot of uh, uh, physical, uh, physical chemical uh, analysis on the, on the continent. Francois, do you have any more information? 
Yes, it's a, the, the, the problem of the analyze of the, of the stones, so of the, the bid, uh, the bid the stones. Uh, uh, for the moment, uh, there, there is no uh, uh, analyze of the, of these stones, uh, uh, just obsidian, uh, uh, sometimes flints, but uh, for the, the green stone, uh, uh, there, there is no reference uh, and uh, or probably local uh, reference uh, from the, the nearest, but not uh, from the um, Cy Cyprus uh, region uh, area. Uh, probably the, the, there is a link uh, uh, between uh, Cyprus from um, uh, uh, Levant and uh, vice versa, enfin, and, um, but uh, th there is no evidence uh, and uh, uh, this is this is a this is a, a general rule for islands everywhere in the world. Um, from from a biological point of view, um, uh, islands are, are uh, wells. That is to say, uh, species arrive to the island, modified on the island, and never come back to the to to, to the continent. Uh, and it is also true from an anthropological point of view, that is to say that the, the cultural traits that are, generally speaking, acquired on the island never come back to, to the continent. This is, this is true most of the time. Of course, we have a lot of counter examples uh, today with the Creole cultures, for example, we, 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 we de which developed uh, widely on the, on the continental areas with cultural specificity which have been acquired on the islands of the Lesser Indies or Indian Ocean. But, but generally speaking, um, Cyprus, what we see on, the, on these uh, exchanges of material uh, between Cyprus and the continent during the PPN is, is within the rule of what is ob generally observed uh, on the islands everywhere in the world and at any time. Mm. Yeah, it definitely has some parallels with with northern and northwestern Europe, uh, and obviously there's still ongoing debate with regards to the you know, the earliest evidence of say uh, domesticated swine, and then you have these rare occurrences such as this very early cattle, uh, which is presumed domestic uh, from Ferreter's Cave uh, yeah. on island itself. So yeah, there's there's lots of interesting comparisons. Uh, and, and following on from that, then, obviously, we, there is no evidence for, uh, for watercraft or boating technology. But I have had a thought. It, it, are there any, uh, is there any evidence or rock art, for instance, whereby people have uh, engraved? Because it's often the case in particularly uh, Western Europe, no, Norway. No, but, but, but there are some uh, small objects in uh, Picrolite. Uh, which um, could uh, figure, may or could figure some uh, small boats, uh, uh, but they are, they are, if they are figurating boats, uh, they figurate uh, round boats uh, out of, uh, of uh, perishable fib vegetal fibers. And it's difficult to imagine that this such such boat can uh, cross mm. 70 kilometers of sea between the continent of Cyprus. Maybe they, they, they could have been used locally, but uh, for such transportation, it's difficult to imagine. But the it's it's uh, yes, it's likely that this small object in Picrolite uh, figure uh, boats. Um, but and, you know, it's difficult also to to understand the relationship between these guys in the in the PPN villages in Cyprus and the sea. Uh, first of all, as I told, uh, uh, there is a kind of taboo in the in the PPN sites, either as Potemnos and uh, and, and Klimonas, because there is absolutely no shellfish or fish. They are turning back to the sea. Uh, it's incredible because they can see the sea from the site, of course, and they come from there. But it's because, maybe because it's, they come from there, that they, they don't want to eat it. I don't know, it's, it's difficult to understand. 
and this situation uh, uh, goes on all along this ninth millennium, because at the beginning of the occupation of Shirokambos, there are only very, very little quantities of, of fish, and, uh, and it's a special fish. It's only very big um, grouper fish. Mm. Only grouper fish. And very big. Nothing else. And uh, we have to wait uh, the end of the eighth millennium, that is to say nearly 10 centuries later, to see some other fish um uh, in the in the boat reports uh and and the release of this kind of uh, taboo um is very late after more than one millennium one millennium and a half it's it's huge so the relationship between these guys and the sea is complex and uh jean Dess already suspected that these people in the villages, we are not the people who, who were in charge of the transportation of, of, of who were uh, able to, to navigate. Uh, we had the knowledge to navigate. And we can suspect, of course, it's something interesting. We can suspect the presence of maritime groups which lived in the seashore, which is now covered by the sea uh, under several uh, tens of meters of sea. Uh, and, and we can suspect the existence of underwater sites uh, telling a completely different story than the one which is told by the, the, the coastal villages. But we have no evidence of that, of course. Yeah, it's, it is fascinating because obviously there's no evidence for them to have exploited, uh, say, marine mammals, as you've said, and, and fish and any sort of aquatic animals, really. Uh, and so the hypothesis for a skin boat, unless it was made out of uh, ruminant skin, would be, the, would be the only real option in terms of uh, a comparison with the ethno-historical record, uh, Inuit examples, for instance. So I'm assuming they probably did use, it, they must have had some sort of raft or... Uh, but, yeah, you so know, it, but, together. And, and Jeff Bailey has previously presented on this. I mean, this the suggested hypothesis of island hopping, particularly in uh, Oceania. Uh, it is possible that you can uh, traverse long distances in no. the open ocean just on a on a simple raft. I mean, I personally wouldn't do it, but no, no, yeah, very dangerous. But just before the conference, we were discussing with one uh, about the La Marmota uh, site, and uh, and uh, uh, it's it's interesting. Uh, we need to more to need to know more about that because uh, it's one of the rare evidence of a naval architecture uh, in the Mediterranean area, uh, and it seems that this this um, boat, which is more recent, of course, but this boat testify of a, a very um, improved um, wooden technique, uh, maybe uh, the presence of a, a mast and, and, and a sail. And I cannot understand, understand how people could have traveled from the continent to Cyprus with cattle uh, or even goat uh, without uh, something like a sail. Mm. Uh, but of course, it's iconoclastic to say that sailing was invented so early in the history of humanity. But why not? We know nothing, of course. <laughs> and if and if, if you couple two boats like the one of uh, of La Marmota with the roof and just put a, a, a sail on it, you have a big boat where you can put a cattle, a lot of material. Uh, if you look at the experiments of uh, I say the Czech guy, I don't remember his name at that time. Rodomir Tichy. Wait, wait, uh, uh, If you look at these experiments, you can see that uh, they can transport uh, 12 people with 500 kilos of, um, of uh, flint or, or stone in, in only one boat, smaller than the one of La Marmota. Yeah. So if you, if you mm -hmm. couple two of them, maybe you can say more, uh, Juan, about that. Yeah, it's uh, Tiki. Tiki is the, the person of uh, make uh, a, a similar boat of La Marmota with 11 meters. 
And uh, in your experiments, in the experiment of Tiki, uh, go to the Croatia, to the Portugal with this, this board. Yeah. But the, I, I invite to come to, uh, to Rome to see the, the board of Marmota because not as only the board, also there is a, a material associated with the board uh, is uh, is incredible because it's very very modern, very is uh, very vanguardist of the this uh, this material. And this is uh, for to to do this board is uh, generation to generation the information to arrive to do this board. Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, one man, one woman made one day this board is. Is a uh, is uh, information is accumulation of information generation to generation. Yeah, and it's not only a question of uh, of uh, naval architecture. It's also a question of knowledge orientation. If you want to travel from the continent to Cyprus, you have to know how to how to uh, to follow uh, the way because at at, at some time you have. You, you cannot see anymore either the continental or the coastal uh, or, or the Cyprus coast. So you have to, to, to have a certain knowledge of, uh, of navigation. And maybe if uh, the travel is long, you have to navigate during the night or, or this and that. So it's, as you say, a, a lot of accumulation of knowledge probably rooted in the, in the Paleolithic or Epipaleolithic uh, traditions that we completely ignored at that time. But which which maybe played a, a major role in the, in the colonization of Ireland or even in the tra transmission of uh, of cultures uh, along the coasts in in all uh, the Mediterranean or North Atlantic area. Mm. Finally, then uh, back onto the rock art question. So there was no evidence, obviously, for uh, no. for boats themselves. But is no. is there any rock art, say, of like rafts or no. just just limited nothing Not in my knowledge the earliest one are in egypt uh, i think the, the the drawing on in rock arts i think the earliest one are in egypt francois knows it better than i yeah it was just another question in the chat which i was chasing up no good and there's a there's a couple of more questions and then we can uh we can probably tie it off then so somebody has made a comment uh with regards to the the structures of Kilmanus, uh, and they've said Tata has asked or mentioned. She's just said that uh, these roundhouses were dug into the ground. Uh, they're very similar with the Mesolithic houses excavated by Robert Kertesz and Tibor Marton in Hungary. So, and they're very similar in some respects to yeah, some Mesolithic structures, at least in in Northern Europe. And then following on from that, that was more of a, a point to be made. Uh, following on from that, how many structures were were excavated or identified in total at the at the site, and how many inhabitants would would they, they have housed? So first uh, of all, these uh, roundhouse models are, are very well known. Uh, uh, in the Epipaleolithic periods and Mesolithic in Europe, of course, but Natufian uh, in the in the Near East, and uh, this is this is the easiest architectural model that we can be done: roundhouses uh, out of stone or earth, because uh, this is the most uh, permanent, sustainable uh, building that you can do. Of course, it's not sustainable for a long time. <laughs> If mm. I can say that, <laughs> these houses were rebuilt very, very frequently after a couple of years, uh, five, six, uh, eight years, and they, they were they, they necessitate constant uh, creation. Um, so this is a model which is well developed, and the square houses with uh, with this difficult problem of uh, of uh, chaining the the angles of the houses only appear um, in some places of the of the PPNB uh, mm. or late PPNA on the, on the continent in uh, the Frates Valley, but not in Cyprus. We have roundhouses all along the time during the, the 
the Kyrokitian period also, and even Sotira period. Uh, the second question is the is an estimate of the of the population living there. When you look at the picture that that I show of this uh, small space of 400 square meters in uh, Klimonas, you have the impression that uh, these buildings were very dense, but they were not. Because they, as, as their life was very short, they were, they were rebuilt very frequently. And if we make the exercise of looking at the contemporary possibility of contemporaneity between the buildings in terms of crossing of the, of the peripheral trenching, you have a Harris matrix which shows that uh, at uh, each time you had only four, five, maximum six building uh, in the same, occupied in the same time. Mm. In addition, not all these buildings were dwelling places. Some of them were probably used for technical use. You have some very small buildings to two meters and a half of diameter, which cannot be considered as a, as a dwelling building. So uh, the density finally on such a, a surface of 400 uh, square meters is uh, three, four buildings, that is to say, maybe uh, one, one or two households of five persons or maximum ten persons with with children. Uh, and and if you if you make an estimation of uh, this for the whole surface of half an hectare of the site, it makes 200, 300 people at mm. the maximum. And uh, some uh, colleagues did that also on bigger sites on the mainland, in PPNA or even early or middle PPNB sites. It's only with uh, the, the the huge sites of uh, two, three, four, uh, until eight, ten hectares of the middle and, and late PPNB that we have several thousands of people living at the same place. And it's a completely different story. The story of these PPNA villages is a story of very small groups. And in addition, it's a story of groups which are, which have a special sedentarity because this village, finally, we, we can now demonstrate it. It's not yet published, but this village lasted at the maximum 60 years yeah. and probably less. So uh, they remake the building, they remake the building and, and it, the, the life, the time life of each earth building is so short that for any reason, disponibility of the earth or architectural difficulties or social difficulties, I don't know. Uh, the, the village finally moves to another place, probably very near. But this is a sedentary model, of course, but it's a, a, a fast-moving sedentary model. And this is also interesting because it asks the question of the exploitation of a large territory. Uh, did, when they moved the village, did they change the field or not? Maybe they, they, they kept the, the same field, I don't know. Or maybe they had to change the field because they, they, are, they were overexploited. And, and there is a lot of questions like that. We cannot, uh, we cannot address them with archaeological uh, evidence. But, um, so the number of, of inhabitants is, was, was probably small. There were small communities. When you look at the beginning of uh, Shiro Combos, which is a rather big site, probably, which was a rather big site, um, at the, during the first period, uh, the first wild boar that you find are old, more, uh, are all, all of them are older than six, seven years. Mm. It's incredible because wild boar never reach or exceptionally reach this age. And there you have, uh, I don't remember, 10 to 12 uh, minimum individuals. And uh, two thirds of them have more than five years. So it's a completely skewed demographic uh, profile, which is probably due to the fact that, that the, the, the hunting pressure by humans, because the humans were the only predator of, of wild boars, the hunting pressure was very, very, very low. And we have to suspect also small groups, really small groups. But how many groups? <laughs> we, 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 we have two, two PPNA sites with Vespokrenos and, uh, and uh, Kimonas. I suspect that they were much more numerous, but always small groups, probably. Brilliant. Okay, well, 
there are no more questions in the chat, and uh, although I have a few more, I think I'll uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, just want to say again, thank you ever so much for the uh, for the presentation. Really good insights into the the sort of hunter gatherer forager transition, especially in a region I am not familiar with at all. Uh, so yeah, I've learned a lot, and I'll I'll definitely uh, have a look at some of your your publications and, and do some further further reading and what have you. Uh, just a note before one maybe has some uh, closing remarks is the next talk will take place next month and I think it's by it's Nicolò Matsuko to, to speak around the Neolithic, Mesolithic Neolithic in the central of Mediterranean in Italy, yeah. especially in Italy. Brilliant. They have it, and obviously further details will be will be coming out shortly. So yeah, once again, thank you ever so much. And Juan, Miriam, do you have any uh, any further remarks? No, only thank you to the, merci Jean Denis and François pour tout. Uh, a été magnifique. Uh, uh, J'espère venir. Uh, uh, à Chipre, mais avec la condition que si vous, voulez, si vous venez à, à Rome. Alors, si vous venez à Rome, je viendrai à Chipre. Bon. D'accord. Ce sont de belles destinations dans les deux cas. Quoi. Euh, venir à Rome, c'est un plaisir, et, et venir à Chypre aussi. Hein. Donc, euh, on organisera ça, alors. Nous devons l'organiser. Nous devons l'organiser. On va l'organiser. Ouais. En, en tout cas, merci pour les... Thank you very much for the questions, which are really stimulating and, uh, and dynamic and, uh, and useful because in this kind of exchange, you always gain in, uh, in reflection. Yeah, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Merci beaucoup pour cette invitation aussi. Puis, je retiens l'invitation pour Rome. J'ai hâte de pouvoir uh, recirculer en Europe et en particulier à Rome. Ça fait très longtemps que je ne suis pas allé. <laughs> Thank you for all. Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Ciao. Ciao. Okay.